Hey, what's up, fiber folks? Welcome back or welcome to High Fiber Knits. My name is Emily and this is podcast episode 11. So a couple of orders of business before we get started. And the first is just thank you so much because I feel like this channel, this community has been growing really rapidly since the holidays, which has been super, super cool. If you found me here on YouTube, hi, welcome. I talk about knitting, mostly knitting, um, occasionally spinning, although I don't have any active spinning projects at the moment, but that's beside the point. Just fiber fun over here. And you can also find me on Instagram at high fiber knits. There used to be an underscore in there, but I took it out. So that's that. Thank you so much. I'm having a great time. I hope you are too. The second thing is the safe for work make along, which I am still running with Kendra from the balanced skein. And we still have like six or seven weeks to, you know, join the fun if you're so inclined to. Uh, the Safe for Work Make Along, really our only rule is whatever your craft is, knitting, crochet, sewing, mostly fiber related arts. Uh, it's making an adult sized garment that works for your lifestyle. So the focus of this make along is really just utility and making knits that we're both going to treasure but get really good use out of in our daily lives. So you can join the action with the hashtag safe for work mal on Instagram and all of our prizes are going to be selected through our finished object thread on Discord. So I'll be sure to link down below how you can join that as well. And on that note, I really only have one project today that I want to talk about, and it is really in the spirit of the Safe for Work make along. Um, I do have a couple whips. Well, in my last podcast episode, I showed a couple whips. Um, my vanilla sock with the night sky yarn from Color of My Fiber, I've really not made any noteworthy progress on, and I don't know if you can see, but my door is one of those lever handles and my dog Sadie has figured out how to open these doors and let herself into rooms if the door will swing inward when she puts her weight on it basically. So I, I recently started my teaching practicum, my final practice teaching block in my Master of Teaching program. So I've been out of the house a lot lately. Uh, going to school to teach and Sadie let herself into my room the other day and I had left my camisole number two whip on my desk and I was knitting that out of Holst Garden Super Soft which of the yarns that I've worked with that's probably like the wooliest or the most rustic of the fibers that I tend to work with and so it smells quite wooly. And so this whip was on my desk and she let herself into the room and she got a hold of the project. Now, thankfully, my Lika fixed circular needles, my three millimeters, those are like my favorite pair of needles that I have. They're okay, thankfully. The yarn is also okay. She didn't like bite through it or anything to like tear it up or tangle it, but there were a ton of dropped stitches, so many dropped stitches and like they were dropped in a way that different stitches had laddered down different amounts of rows. It was just, I couldn't save that. I couldn't save that with a crochet hook or anything like that. So I basically just frogged all of that and that was like once almost one whole skein's worth of work. So it hurt a little bit, but I figured that would be easier than trying to salvage whatever had happened to the project. All of that is to say, I still have stuff on the go, but I just wanted to talk about my camisole. This is not a camisole. Anticlimactic. 
my cardigan. My champagne cardigan by Petite Knit. I don't know why those words were so hard to get out. My champagne cardigan by Petite Knit. I am going to be doing a segment where I show how I style the champagne cardigan, so stay tuned for that. I'll have all the timestamps and relevant links for yarns, patterns, creators, all in the description box. Now, I am going to sort of go through my thoughts on this project, sort of like section by section. I don't know what like the best sequence to talk about things is going to be, but I'll talk about perhaps like the yarn and the fabric. And then I'll probably talk about the needles that I used and my experience with sort of the construction of the project and the different phases of the project that I went through and yeah just like what my thoughts what my thoughts on it are so this is her this is my champagne cardigan by Petite Knit so this project has been on my to knit list since it came out basically as soon as Petite Knit released this pattern, I was like, I need that. I need to knit it. I bought the pattern like instantaneously and I sat on it for several months, which is quite unlike me. I prefer to purchase patterns basically the day I'm prepared to cast them on. So the reason why I hadn't was mostly well, firstly, I had a lot of other projects planned already, and I had the yarn for them that I wanted to follow through. But the yarns that Petite Knit called for in the pattern, I don't know if it's just because I am from Toronto, I'm here in Canada, and some of the European brands I can't get too easily um, for me to knit that sweater in the yarns Petite Knit called for, it would have been like over $250 Canadian, which I think is a little bit too much for my current like employment status. Like I'm still a student. I do work, but I wouldn't say like, it's not like, I'm not working full time yet. I will be in the spring, exciting. But um, anyway, it would have been really expensive. And not that this is like an issue, but I have noticed that the yarns Petite Knit calls for tend to be quite expensive, like the yarns in her samples and the alternatives that are suggested in the patterns. And that's okay, because at least I am super fortunate to be living in a place where I can get things shipped or there's enough yarn shops here in Toronto that I can go pick out stuff and there are very suitable alternatives, um, but it just took me a while to figure out what combination of yarns I was going to use and also really importantly what color I was going to knit because I already had proof of concept for the cardigan. I used to wear cardigans all the time and the last time I owned a cardigan was maybe like four years ago and it was this pretty like cheap chunky knit black acrylic cardigan and it got ruined. It was just like pilling all over the place. It hung on to every little white speck of whatever that it could cling to. So once that exited my wardrobe, I just never added back in a cardigan and because I'm nearing the end of my teacher education and I'm going to be teaching more or less full time pretty soon, I thought a cardigan would be a really good thing to have. And it's something that I've found myself like actively thinking about like, oh, I wish I had a cardigan to put on with X outfit or Y dress would be better if I could like layer something over top of it for, for teaching purposes. So. I had the proof of concept for the cardigan, but for the color, I knew I didn't want to knit black because first of all, knitting black is scary. And second of all, I know that like black knitted fabrics hang on, like 
you can see if they're holding on to stuff like fluffs or whatever really really easily um our dog sadie she's kind of light brown so she would definitely show up all over that so i didn't want to do black white and cream also kind of scare me a little bit just in terms of appearing dirty and so i thought maybe gray and then i thought maybe not gray because i had decided that you know i have slightly warmer undertones and i didn't want to pick a gray that was going to wash me out all of this is to say that after a lot of reflection i landed on gray and i found two knit picks yarns that when combined still cost me about a hundred dollars canadian to make this project so these are the yarns that i picked we have the two knit picks yarns this is a loft which is their silk mohair in the colorway silver and this is the Simply Wool Worsted, which is a 100% non-superwash wool. This is like really squishy. It's a beautiful neutral gray heather color called Winkle. And so a 100 gram skein of this gives you about 218 meters or meters or yards. I'm not sure it's about the same quantity as like a skein of Cascade 220 um but this is worsted weight and I believe her pattern calls for a strand of mohair held with a strand of DK uh but I would say if you like know you love Cascade 220 that'd definitely be a good option for this project so these are the two yarns and you can see I think this is perfect that you know the super cool toned mohair and the more neutral edging on warm toned gray here in the wool are kind of blended together perfectly in this fabric and i'll hold my arm up a bit closer so you can see i really love how the heathering in the wool and then the occasional sort of poke of the silk strand from the mohair shining through gives this fabric some visual interest. So I really enjoyed working with both of these yarns. I knit a size medium or the third size offered in the pattern. And I used like exactly five skeins of the wool and four and four skeins and like five meters of the mohair. So I believe like quite an economical project. I will say though, I knit the medium, but because this is worsted and they used needle sizes called for in the pattern, I do think I have a bit of a larger gauge or looser fit, although I haven't actually measured and I don't feel too inclined to measure it because I am pretty happy with the gauge. I might measure it if I ever choose to knit this again in maybe more of a statement color, but that's beside the point. I really liked working with both of these yarns. I did not experience any issues with either of these yarns. I think I encountered one knot somewhere in a ball of mohair, but I join in new balls of mohair by knotting them together anyway so that didn't really make a difference to me it would have been more problematic if there were knots in the wool skeins which there weren't so i was super pleased about that i will also say that this wool is very very consistent um one of the other knit picks yarns that i have in my stash is one of their sock yarns called Hawthorne, which is a two ply. And what I've noticed with Hawthorne, as I've not really done a whole project with it, but I've played around with it a bit, is that sometimes the singles don't have a lot of twist, but there's a very high ply twist, which means that the yarn itself is a little 
I don't think it's the yarn itself that's unbalanced because I know there's like specific ways to describe this stuff for spinning. Uh, but basically what happens is as I'm working with the yarn, it twists back on itself and sort of like plies itself again, if that if that makes sense. Um, which it like it can be a little bit frustrating because you're like constantly needing to smooth those out as you're working with it. Um, but the twist of the singles and the twist of the plies and the thickness of this yarn is super wonderful and consistent. I love it. I, I did compare this to, so I would say like Cascade 220 is probably like a pretty solid match for this yarn, but I have also compared it to the Barocco Vintage line in terms of the structure of the yarn but Barocco Vintage is I think like roughly 40% wool blended with acrylic and nylon so there's a more substantial plastic content in that yarn and when I knit Petite Knits Sunday sweater in Barocco Vintage Chunky it felt heavy and when I wear that sweater, which I don't wear it often um, because I don't like the feeling of the acrylic on my skin too much, but when it's on, you can see, especially around the shoulders, that the weight of the sweater itself, like the yarn, just pulls it down and I can feel it on my body too. So it's like visible and I can feel it. And so I didn't like that too much, but this on the other hand, I don't know why I think this is about the same like weight roughly of yarn itself but the way this sweater drapes I think is just much much nicer so that's enough on the yarn the next thing I'm going to talk about The next thing I'm going to talk about, because it kind of goes along with the yarn conversation, is my button choice. And so I feel like I'm going to be doing a lot of up and down, but you can see I've gone for these sort of muscle shell pearl buttons. And the reason for this is associated with a little bit of a story. So I had posted on my Instagram, High Fiber Knits. A reel basically saying which buttons should I use for the champagne cardigan so option one was this like classic brown kind of like tortoise shell button and option two were these absolutely fabulous pink acrylic buttons with these like colorful speckles in them from pigeon wishes and so most folks said go for the brown buttons because it's going to be more of a classic and therefore wearable look but if you like the idea of having like a statement or a little bit of a pop then go for the pink buttons i agreed but i felt like these brown buttons were still a little bit too warm for the fabric that's that was knitting up and I think I'm going to save these for potentially another champagne cardigan but in a color that actually draws on some of the colors in the buttons I still wanted buttons that were classic but had a little something extra a little something special to them so I did a little bit more searching online and I found these muscle shell buttons at the Knitting Loft. And I love these because they have this gorgeous, one of a kind, like all of them are unique. They have this organic sort of texture to them even. I don't know if they're real muscle shell, but I think they are. And then they might be finished with something or like polished kind of special but they're all different 
These are 22 millimeter sized buttons and I think the pattern says you can use anything from 20 to 23 millimeters. Although I think you could even get away with 25 millimeters if you are knitting at a slightly higher gauge or like larger gauge. Um, I'm sure if I was right on gauge, the buttonholes wouldn't be as big. But anyway, these are the buttons I went for because they're classic with a twist. And there's something just very unique about all of these that I really appreciate. I, I got two extra just in case the ones currently on the sweater ever break. But yeah, I'm super pleased with how these look with the fabric. I think they're they're special enough to draw the eye, but they don't take away from the rest of the cardigan, which I'm quite happy about. So the next thing I want to talk about about this sweater is my experience actually knitting it. And that was a little bit of a mixed bag. So first thing is knitting back and forth flat stockinette not really a problem. Sure, it took a while, but I found this to be quite a meditative project. And I'm thinking of making a scrappy half and half triangles wrap by Pearl Soho. And I think this was a good, like, if I enjoyed knitting this much stockinette flat, then I'll be fine to do like a whole ton of garter flat. Uh, so knitting the body, doing the short rows, doing the raglans, no problems. I really, really liked it. Um, I was quite impressed with myself for not making any mistakes on the raglans either. I will say the raglan is quite wide. Like you can see, this is my body. And then that's how far out or like the raglan comes quite deep. But I, I like that look. I, and I like the feeling. I, I like that my arms touch the side of my body without getting fabric like caught up here, but that's just a personal preference for fit. So all of that was great. The sleeves were super, super quick to knit. I knit each sleeve in about a day and a half each, uh, which I don't know. I typically don't have trouble with Sleeve Island because by the time I'm there, I'm just like, I'm ready for the project to be done. So, uh, yeah, most of, most of my experience actually knitting this garment was fantastic. I did make a couple of modifications. So the first modification is for the length. Like I said, I knit size medium, but I knit the body to be about seven centimeters shorter than what she called for in the pattern. And the reason for that is as I was knitting, I, I was trying it on, of course, because it's top down, it's raglan, so you can try it on as you go. And I felt like it was getting long enough and I had messaged one of my knitting friends on Instagram because I know she knit this also some time ago. I said, did you feel like the body was too long? Did you make modifications to the body? And she said to me, yes, absolutely. I knit the body about seven, five to seven centimeters shorter, but then I had to knit the sleeves longer, which, which I experienced as well. So I decided to do the body shorter so that it's my ideal length of crop. And when I say crop, to me, that's something that lands either at or just like an inch below the top of my pants. So if I'm wearing high-waisted bottoms, right, my belly button's here, here's the button of my jeans, the cardigan sort of lands right around there as well because I have quite a rectangular body shape and I'm close to five foot eight. I find if it's more cropped than meeting the top of my pants, or if it's longer than my hip bones, you know, like if you, if you put your hands on your hips and you can feel them, if it's any longer than that, I feel like my rectangular shape 
is emphasized or my proportions are thrown off because although I am tall, I do have a longer body than legs or um, my sort of my thighs. So my hip to knee is longer than my knee to ankle proportionately, uh, not like absolute value. Of course, it's going to be longer. Anyway, beside the point. It was intentional. I did it shorter intentionally and I'm happy that I did. And then the sleeves I also did do longer. So what I noticed on myself, probably in part because I knit with worsted and mohair, was that as I was knitting down and you can see sort of the line, I don't know how well you can see the line, but you can sort of see it there. The line of decreases. So I was, as I was doing the evenly spaced decreases, I made it to about here. And I thought the armhole was still too large. And I knew that as per pattern, I wouldn't be going down in needle size for the ribbing. So I decided to throw in two extra rows of decreases. So I decreased an extra four stitches in total. And I added about five rows before switching to the ribbing to give me an extra inch and a half of length on the sleeve. And I think that was a good call because as you can see, if I just stick out my arm, the edge of the sleeve comes to right about this like bony part, the styloid process of the radius bone because I'm an anatomy nerd. <laughs> basically that bump in my wrist. That's that's the ideal sleeve length for me. Um, it's nice to sometimes be able to go like this, but I like having my hands pretty free most of the time. So I did need a little bit of length. I think I got quite lucky with how perfect the length ended up working out. And that's all I have to say really about modifications. I did do the tubular or the sewn bind off on everything, uh, meaning the two sleeves and the hem. And I think it's absolutely gorgeous. I know some people don't like doing two rows of double knitting and then a sewn bind off because it, by doing the double knitting, you kind of get this like little puffiness because double knitting is twice thick, right? Um, but I, I love it. I think it gives the pattern a really nice and refinely finished look. And that's probably one of the most important things I have to say about this pattern, because I found that with some other patterns, and maybe this is me saying it, you know, about a year and a bit into my knitting journey, but it seems that some patterns if you are really going to make something special from that pattern, you kind of need to have that experience as a knitter to like know how to modify it to maybe have better waist shaping or get the sleeve shaping the way you want. Yarn selections, like the types of cast ons and bind offs that you use sometimes you need to have that kind of knowledge to be able to either interpret the pattern effectively or make modifications that give you a more refined finished object. I don't really know totally what I'm talking about, but what I will say about this pattern is that everything is laid out for you. And if you follow that pattern word for word, you're going to get a project that looks like it left a store basically it's so clean and well done and any written instructions that might be considered arbitrary which i'd argue none of them are there are videos showing you exactly what techniques to do and how to do it case in point being the button band i thought this button band and the buttonholes were brilliantly constructed and although I thought I understood what the written instructions meant, 
just seeing the video gave me a lot of confidence to be able to go ahead and do it because this button band was another reason why I had waited so long to knit this project actually. So yeah, absolutely fabulous pattern, but petite knit patterns typically are, like this isn't news to anybody. So yeah, but okay, I think the last two notes I think I have to make about this project uh, are about, Yes, the sleeve. So one thing about the sleeves, and this is not anything to do with the pattern. This is just a general thing that I learned while doing this project. I have knit now the cardigan, Sari Nordlin's Luminin Pullover, which is a raglan pullover. Sari Nordlin's Celeste Tee, which is a circular lace yoke and Petite Knits Sunday Sweater, which is a circular yoke, which is just like ribbing with increases worked in. And so with those constructions, you start at the top, you go down, you put stitches on hold for the sleeves, you cast on for the underarm, you knit the body down, and then you return to the sleeves. And typically in the instructions, what I've seen is start at the end, or start at the corner where you started casting on for the underarm, pick up all of those cast on stitches, knit all of the stitches you'd put on hold, but then you put your beginning of round marker in the middle of those picked up stitches. And that always perplexed me because I was like, well then if you're doing it that way, aren't you knitting that first half of picked up stitches an extra time compared to every other stitch. It didn't make sense to me. And I was like, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe the effect of that is unnoticeable and inconsequential in the final product, but it always perplexed me. And so when it came time to re revisit the sleeves on the champagne cardigan, um, I just, I looked up a video because I wanted to remind myself how to do it properly, especially because when you transition from the stitches you cast on to the stitches you put on hold, just the way you pick up the extra stitches in the corner to make sure you close the gap, I wanted a refresher on that. And so I ended up finding a video by, I need to check my knitting notes actually. I ended up finding a video by Natasha Childers, which was basically like, this is how you pick up sleeve stitches and continue going. But what she did in that video was she said, start picking up your stitches from that beginning of round, then go knit your stitches that were put on hold and then finish picking up the rest of your stitches when you get back to that beginning of round. And I don't know if this is common knowledge. I always thought you had to pick up all of the underarm stitches first because the placement of the beginning of round marker is in the instructions after it tells you to do all of that. So maybe it's common knowledge. Maybe this is like the greatest sleeve hack ever. I don't know. I, it just kind of blew my mind and it was like, not like a, kind of maybe like a little bit like a revelation, but it felt more like a resolution. It felt like something in me had been put to peace. And I don't know, I just thought it was great. So next time you're doing a top down sweater construction, and you have to pick up stitches under the arm, start in the middle, right where your beginning of round is going to go, and then you're not knitting any stitches an extra time. Hashtag life hacks, I don't know. Um, so that was just like, wow, I wanted to share that. Uh, and the last thing I wanna talk about is needle size. So the pattern tells you to knit pretty much everything, except for the button band, and four and a half millimeter needles. 
and then the button band calls for three millimeter needles. So the first thing is you can see right here, it's like a faint line, but I do believe it's like, it's not visible in the sense that it irritates me, but it's visible in the sense that if you're looking for it, you'll find it. You can see this is where I put my stitches on hold and then started working a smaller circumference in the round. Now, if you watch Andrea Mowry's I'll Knit and Now Spin <laughs> if I want, uh, she has spoken many times about how most knitters, when they're working or when we are working on small circumferences, we will knit tighter than when we are working uh, on larger circumferences. Moreover, when you're working flat versus working just straight up stockinette, you're going to have, or sorry, when you're working flat versus working stockinette in the round, because you're not purling in the round, your gauge is also going to be different. So I knew all of this and the pattern didn't tell me to switch needle sizes. So I didn't switch needle sizes. And really this, this doesn't bug me. I don't think it's a big deal, but this is case in point. Andrea, thank you for letting us know. I'm sorry I didn't listen, um, but part of me feels like going up to a five millimeter needle might have just made the sleeves too loose and then baggy as well. So it's kind of one of those use your knitter's judgment, I guess, and whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. But yeah, I don't know if you can see it. Hmm, it's not as noticeable on this sleeve, but I can actually feel it, which I think is super interesting. Um, but if you didn't know, now you know. You knit tighter when you're working smaller circumferences. Um, and so the other point about needle size that I wanted to make was that the button band is supposed to be worked at the same row gauge as the stockinette fabric, which if it's not, so if your double knitting gauge for the button band is too big, then your button band's going to be longer than the rest of your fabric, which will have a weird look. And if your row gauge is too small, then your button band will sort of shrink up the rest of the cardigan. And I do have that happening here. You can see this sort of like V and that the back, the back being noticeably longer than the front. I don't mind this, but I did think it was strange that she said, go from 4.5 millimeter needles to three millimeter needles and have the same row gauge. She does say use whatever needle size will give you the same row gauge, but it's a little bit hard to test that out unless you swatch in both double knitting and in stockinette. But I didn't even have three millimeter needles to knit the button band on because my only three mil needles were on my camisole number two. Those were fixed circulars. So I used 3.25 mils and my row gauge was still too short. So I would suggest, especially if you know that you are a tight knitter, you could, if you need to go down a needle size, so maybe go to like a four for the body and then up a needle size for the button band to kind of meet it in the middle, that could be an option. Um, I wouldn't suggest going up to a four for the button band. I wouldn't push it past 3.75, but part of me also feels like you know, three, 3.25, 3.5, 3.75, like, unless, unless you have an interchangeable set that has all of those sizes, like, you kind of just got to work with what you've got. But anyway, it's just something to be mindful of. I used 3.25 mils and most of the discrepancy did block out, but not all of it. 
you could block as aggressively as you want, but I don't know how much that can really compensate for differences in row gauge. So I did want to make that point. The last thing that I wanted to show you now is actually how I would style my champagne cardigan. Uh, sort of in the spirit of the safe for work make along, uh, the idea is to get wear and use out of our knits. So I do plan to do a video coming up about sort of my teacher capsule wardrobe, including my hand knits. But for now, I thought I'd just show you the champagne cardigan stuff. So I'm gonna move over here so you can see the cutaways here. So the first outfit is how I have the champagne cardigan styled today. And all three of these outfits I'm just wearing with a pair of white high top platform Converse because I think they're loads of fun. But this is perhaps the most casual. I would wear this cardigan. I have it styled with just a white singlet tank top or base layer, fitted camisole, whatever you want to call it, and a pair of high-waisted light wash jeans that I thrifted. Uh, I think these were Levi's 550s, maybe 560s. One of the styles that has a much looser like basically in their full length, thrifted them for $12, which I feel like it's really hard to find Levi's that cheap. But anyway, uh, I really like this look because it's low contrast, meaning that the light wash denim with the light gray, uh, I think they don't really compete with one another. And the jeans kind of make the outfit a bit more cool, feel a bit more fresh which I really enjoy, so that's one way. The second way I would still style this cardigan is with high contrast, but in a way that really lets the cardigan itself shine. So in this case, I've just paired it with a fitted black t-shirt and my favorite pair of black high-waisted trousers. And I think this outfit is just cool, casual, super easy. As I said, it really just lets the cardigan show itself off. And so this final outfit is maybe like the fanciest that I would wear the cardigan. And here I've paired it with this ribbed midi dress in a slate blue color that I've had in my closet for a few years. And I really love this dress. The fabric is nice and thick. So even though it's quite fitted, I feel very confident in it. And it's a tasteful length. But for teaching, I think it's good if you're going to wear a fitted dress to have sort of a second layer, especially if your dress is sleeveless, uh, which this one, although it has wide straps, it is sleeveless. Um, I just think it's good to have an extra layer. And so part of the reason I ended up settling on this gray colorway and the oyster buttons was because I knew it was going to play really well with this dress in particular. And this is one of those instances where I feel like making selections for my knitting and my knitwear very intentionally is actually allowing me to make other pieces in my wardrobe more versatile. So it's not just about having, you know, knitwear pieces that are versatile. It's about making other pieces in your wardrobe more versatile by, you know, picking patterns and colors intentionally. So those are the three ways I would style my champagne cardigan. And that kind of concludes all of the knitting related stuff that I wanted to talk about. Uh, perhaps I can give a few sort of like life updates the first being that I got my driver's license, finally. <laughs> Here in Ontario, um, if you don't know, we have a graduated licensing system. So when you're 16, you can do the written test for your learner's permit or your G1. And then a year later, you're eligible for your first road test, 
which is the G2 if you pass it. And then a year after that, roughly, you can go for your full G license. And you have five years to get that whole process done, pretty much. I had gotten my G1 a month after I turned 16 in 2014. And then I went away from my undergrad and so I wasn't driving or practicing. And then in the summers I worked downtown. So I was taking public transit to get down there, like the subway. And I didn't get my G2 until a couple months before my five years were up, which meant that I got another five year extension, although I had to pay for it. And then in January, I finally got my full G license after this whole fiasco where it was like minus 24 degrees and I got to the drive test center. I had turned off my car, I went inside to check in, I came back outside and my car battery was dead. <laughs> so I had to like reschedule, it was very stressful. But I am just so happy that like eight years after getting my G1, I am a licensed driver and I just need to worry about renewing the card every five years. I don't need to do any more tests or anything like that. So that's really exciting. Uh, the other couple of life updates, I guess, just sort of related to school and work. At uh, this point, I am doing my practicum pretty much full time. So I'm going into a school and I am teaching grade nine science and grade 12 biology, which like grade 12 bio is probably one of my favorite courses in all the high school curriculum. And it's probably most closely related to what I studied in undergrad. But I'm just having so much fun and things are finally starting to feel kind of real for me. Uh, what I mean by that is like just being there with the students and you being in a department office with other science teachers and math teachers and having that social aspect back has been very, very beneficial for my teacher identity. And because I had done a virtual practicum this time last year, I had become really interested in the impacts of virtual teaching and learning, specifically for practicum experiences on pre-service teachers' professional identity development. And I've said a few times here on this channel, like, oh, I gotta work on my research project for my Master of Teaching. Like, I had just alluded to it a lot, but I don't think I ever said what I was studying. And so that's what I studied. And it was a super cool project. Uh, what I really find fascinating about professional identity and identity in general, is that there's so many different social and cultural and environmental factors that influence it. And so like, it's not this static thing. Identity is always in flux and even the things that you do impact your identity. Um, and so I, I just became very curious to know what the experiences of my fellow teacher candidates were uh, with their virtual practicum experiences. And I think it's super important that we, we understand kind of what identity tensions and challenges candidates are experiencing as they go through their teacher education, especially now because the education system, at least in Ontario, is still in a pretty big state of flux with all of the changes that have come about because of COVID and there being a really high demand right now for qualified teachers. Uh, it's super important that we have educators entering the workforce who have a sense of their values and priorities and their beliefs paired with good pedagogical background uh, and the confidence and commitment to deliver a fulsome educational experiences to students like we really need that now and a big part of being a resilient and flexible educator and a committed educator is knowing who you are as an ed educator and 
it really is quite closely tied to who we are as people as well. So yeah, that, that's the long, that's the long, uh, that's the long but still abridged version of my research. Um, and I just think it's, it's incredible how, like, being educated with a science background and being taught that empirical studies are like quantitative and the bigger your sample size the better they are and like science is objective like I was always taught that but doing research in education or the social sciences on topics that like I am currently living through I find it to be so fascinating and it's really driven home for me the fact that who we are is really a part of every single thing that we do and there is a certain degree of responsibility as well that comes with that so yeah i don't know i'm at the end of this teacher education program and it's ironic that it's like the master of teaching program and i'm like i still have tons to learn and it's never gonna stop I'm gonna keep learning forever. Like, it's literally my job. One of our professional standards, <laughs> um, being ongoing professional learning. So yeah, all of this is to say that like actually being in a school now, comparing that to my virtual practicum, I was really proud of everything I was able to learn and accomplish and, and do during that virtual practicum, but I still felt like a student I didn't really feel like a teacher, uh, but now being in a school environment and having those social interactions makes me feel a lot more like I've made that transition from seeing myself as a student to seeing myself as a competent teacher. And yeah, I think that's just a big step for me. Like mentally and, and career wise. So it's nothing but good times here. I mean, it is a lot of work, but it's it's fun work. It's creative work and it's social work. So uh, not social work, but you know, there's socialization involved in the work. Um, and I'm just so grateful to have super supportive friends in the program. I'm super grateful to have really supportive faculty who believe in me and are willing to mentor me and collaborate with me uh, so that we can, you know, work on making the program better and like better equipped to support teacher candidates through these identity development phases when their identities are particularly or especially like undergoing change. Um, and I'm just, yeah, so grateful to have this community here that I can spend 40 minutes talking about my knitting, but then also spend 15 minutes talking about my life and people are equally excited for me in both areas. Uh, that's just super cool. Most of the time I have no trouble talking, but when I try to express my gratitude, I am at a loss for words. So yeah, I guess with, with that, I'm gonna say thank you one last time. <laughs> And I am going to wish you all, as usual, good health and happy knitting. Bye, everyone.